Hi there grade 10, 11s and 12s. Welcome to Dandelion Delphi Tutorials. We're going to look at our ITPAT Phase 1 document that you have to create in Word today. I want you to press pause and grab your PAT document as well as a pen as this lesson is a general explanation and your PAT might be different this year. You will see at the back of every PAT there is an annexure with the rubric that we are going to use to mark this with. And this is what you want to keep your eye on. So in your Word document, create a front page with your name and your surname or whatever else your teacher required. On the next page, create a main heading, scenario and scope. And then we're going to create four subheadings. The first subheading is the topic. Usually on page 6 of this document, you are giving a general scenario. And here you want to state underneath your topic exactly what your topic is that you picked within that scenario. For example, this year the scenario is an NPO or an NGO. And you could explain here how you will be creating a program for an SPCA. The next subheading is the purpose. Here you want to explain why this company, or in this case NGO, needs your program. What are their needs? The third one is a possible solution. And here you will describe how your program would meet the needs of this company, or in this case NGO. And then finally the last bullet is the scope. And here you will explain what your program can and also what your program won't be able to do. In total, the scenario and scope should be more or less 200 words. The next main heading is the user requirements. And here we need to state who our users are. We are usually required to have two different types of users that will use your system. Like for example, a staff member or and a person donating, so a donor or maybe an admin person and a client. You have two options here. You can either do it in a table format or in a use case that I will show you now. This video is quite long, so if you get a bit tired, make sure you take down the time so that you can go back and continue to watch. Here is an example of a use case. So in this example, we have an administrator and then we have a family in need and a person donating. You do not need three types of users. You can have only two of them. And in here you are explaining what your program is actually going to do and what this user will be able to do. And on this side here, indicate what this person will be doing on your program. Let's say we have an administrator. We're just going to look at the bottom bit here. That would be enough. They are able to view the NPO information, select a type of donation, make a donation. Not that I know that the administrator is going to do that, but this is an example from the GDE. They can also manage the admin login and manage and update the database. The person donating don't have access to these functions of your program. And they can only view the NGO information, select a type of donation and make a donation. Another option is to use a table instead of the diagram. Then you need to create this table here, two users. So instead of user one, they say who your user is. Instead of user two, name, give them a name. Not like John or Sue, but rather like administrator or client. In the left here, list the role, activity and limitations. And here you will explain what the role is that they will perform in your program. For example, they will keep the data on the database up to date. And what is their activity? Here you will list the tasks they will be performing. Like for example, add a new product or in the NGO example, maybe add a new NGO change prices and so on and then under limitations you will list here what they can't do this year needs to be done properly 
in full for both users to score your four marks. Your next heading is the navigation. I'll show you an example just now. It's important to indicate where your program starts and ends and then how a person would run through your program. So they would log on if they are registered, then they can go to the home page. If they're not registered, then they will sign up and then go to your home page. And from your home page, they can go then to the different pages. Make use of your arrows to indicate if they can go only in one direction or if they can go back and forth. For the grade 11s and 12s, the next part would be your database design and data structures. Here you have to ask your teacher what to do. I usually just ask my learners to put the database inside of the phase one folder and I mark it directly from Access. But your teacher might require you to create some screenshots. We have already done all of this in the first pack video I posted. Grade 12s could then be asked also to create a class description or a class diagram with the following and I suggest you use a UML to create this with. This is what the UML looks like. We have the name of the class at the top and our private fields listed at the top. So all with a minus that indicates that they are declared under private. These are our attributes with their data types. And then below that we indicate all our methods. Public methods will have the plus next to them, private methods the minus, and important to indicate the data types of your parameters if they have, and if it is a function to return a data type there as well. Grade 10s, you will not benefit from the next two slides, but grade 11 and 12s, you need to have text files as well as array. So create a heading text file. You only need one. Write a heading purpose and write down what the purpose is of your text file. Why do you need this text file? And then also indicate the format of your text file. I'm sure in an exam you have seen this before to show you what the format of a text file is. And then also include your comma separator or your character se separator, which in this case is a hash. And then give an extract of your data. What is important is that you don't include the data from your database in your text file. This must be different data. However, you could maybe link the text files to your database by using the values from the primary key inside of your text file. Your next heading should be your parallel arrays. First sub bullet is again the purpose. Explain what the purpose is. Things like, for example, sorting it according to one of the arrays, searching through the arrays to find a specific value, doing some calculations, finding the highest or the lowest average, possibly removing duplicates. You don't have to list all of these, but these are some ideas. Think about what you've done with arrays before and see how that would fit into your scenario. Your next bullet should be populating the array. So how would the arrays get values? Would they read from the text file into the array or would they get values some other way? Again, your array should not be duplicate values from your database. And then create a heading with the declarations and write down your declarations for the arrays down here. Our next part of the mark sheet is the GUI design and that we covered in the previous lesson. We are then required to describe our input. So create a heading data input. We have to do this for two forms. So make sure they are the two forms with the most input that you can describe here. Then put a screenshot of your form that you are going to describe and create this table to ensure that you have everything needed as per the mark sheet. At the top of this table, just give your form a name so that its purpose is clear to your teacher marking this. These headings here now need to be completed. Having just two rows completed in here would not be enough. This is just an example for you. Here in the first column you will describe what the input is. Then you will describe the source. 
You only need to write down source here. You don't, these are just examples for you. But how is the input arriving into the program? So is the user entering it on a keyboard? Are they clicking on a, with a mouse? Is it from the text file array or the data type database? And then the data type of this input. You guys are all familiar with data types. You might then want to explain the format, especially with dates and strings. You want to describe what would this data look like. So let's say the person is entering a name, but we require them to enter something that does not have more than 20 characters, for example, that you could put in here. If it's a date, you would describe the date by using the M's, D's and Y's to describe what the date should look like. Here's an example of gender. So we're either going to store an M or an F, and you could include here, how would that be stored? In this last column here, you just want to list the component you are going to use. An edit, checkbox, combo box, and so on. Remember, this is input, not processing or output. That's all we're describing here is the user's input. And this needs to be done for two forms with significant input. The next is our input validation. We need to validate at least four different data types and we need at least four inputs validated. So I, this top part here just means that you can either validate input or processing, but I just do all four of ours on, of the different data types on inputs from the user. But you also need to validate if there's a null value that I'll show you now, as well as test if the component was selected. So if you do your four different data types on input, you need at the end six to add these two as well. And then you need to describe your error message. I'll start with the extra two that was listed. You can test if an edit box was left empty to score this mark that says validate for null or empty fields. Remember, for each of these validations, you need to have an error message. So you could create another table again, listing what is validated and then the error message that you would display. Second one is to test if something was selected. You can use your combo box dot item index to test if that's less than zero. That means the person didn't select from the combo box. And then you need four data types. And here are some ideas. Maybe you have a real input somewhere and you could use try string to float to test if it is a valid real data type. And then you can also use for a string data type, maybe you can test if what the person enters are letters from the alphabet and a space or something like that. You can also use integer numbers to check for a range to test, let's say, an adult had to make a booking for a hotel, then that input for the adult needs to be higher than zero, else it's invalid. And since you have a text file, when you're reading from the text file and you're going to use file exist, that would be a text file data type. So here we have input one, two, three, four different data types. Another idea is when you have a date time picker, you can then test if that what the user selected is maybe not before or after a certain date, depending on your scenario. You could, for example, test for the hotel one that the arrival date is not after your departure date. There's another video explaining more validation in the PAT playlist that you can watch. Your next heading is your data processing. You need to list for and then another four with some algorithms. So the top four could include, if you're in 11 and 12, some SQL and database processing, but not the bottom ones necessarily. Grade sense, you might have less to list as well, and everyone just needs to look at the mark sheet to see what the requirements are. Here you just have to describe for the top four what will be processed. But then you need another four and then you need to write algorithms for each one of them. Make sure that the four you list at the bottom 
have significant processing to show that your algorithms. If you are looking for algorithm examples, you can go to education.gov.za and download the final of 2014, the paper 1. In question 1.4, there's an algorithm, but you should also ask your teacher to explain that to you. On my channel in the playlist question 4 and 5, you will also find a video explaining algorithms. Significant processing is really being done when we're dealing with our text files and our arrays in our programs. So maybe choose from some of these and write your algorithms on those. We can't really write an algorithm for a SQL statement. If you have some database processing, that you could do by looping through a database. That could be a good algorithm as well. These I have listed before. So for example, reading from the text file into the array or however you're populating the arrays, sorting your arrays, searching your arrays, and great things, you could maybe find the highest, lowest, and average of values. And any of these, but you only need four. I'm not saying that you have to pick from these. These are just some ideas that make good algorithms. The last part of phase one is our data output. So create that heading. And you need to describe the output on two forms with significant output. There's no point in just listing your DB grid here all the time. It's not going to score much marks. So make sure you use a variety of output. In the output, as well as in this processing, we are not interested in your validation. So don't include your validation messages here. This is for your other data that has been processed and what will be produced as output then. Again, for two forms, you want to describe the output. So put a name here that describe the purpose of that form. In this column, list what you are displaying. And in the middle column here, the format in which you display it in. I suggest that you look at past papers. You will see that the format is often described like this to you in an exam paper. Follow that method. Or maybe you're displaying in a rich edit and you have neat columns and you describe what your headings will be and also for cost that it will display it in a RAND currency. And in your last column here, you will then just put down the component in which you are going to display. Again, two lines won't be enough. Each form needs to have significant output and make sure you spend some time on this middle column for the formatting. When you have gone all the way to the output and completed that, I suggest you then go back to the description that we did at the beginning and see if you maybe can add or change something in there because often by the end of phase one, you have a better, clearer idea of what your pet is actually going to do. And then you should use the mark sheet that have been printed for you to make sure that you have scored all the marks. So use the mark sheet then to mark your own pet. It's also a great idea if you have someone to read through it for you. Thank you for watching Dandelion Delphi tutorials. I hope this helped you for your pet phase one. And I hope to see you soon.